welcome to the Nonprofit Report, your weekly update on nonprofit organizations, issues, and leaders. I'm your host, Mark Oppenheim, and today's guests are Ellen Futter, President of the American Museum of Natural History in New York, Michael Govan, Director of the Los Angeles County Museum of Art, and Jeff Patchen, President and CEO of the Children's Museum of Indianapolis. Thank you for joining us, panel, and a reminder to our webinar guests that you can ask questions through Q&A and chat functions at the bottom of your screen, and we'll try to cover those topics during the show or afterwards. But Ellen, why don't we start um, as, the, as the head of the American Museum of Natural History, talk a little bit about how your team is dealing with the coronavirus in these times. Well, first of all, good morning uh, to all, and it's a pleasure to be here with you, Mark, and with my distinguished uh, panelists. Um, you know, the American Museum of Natural History is 150 years old and right smack in the middle of we celebrating our 150th anniversary. And our mission, which is an integrated one of science and education, including a graduate school where we give a PhD in comparative biology. Our collections are over 34 million specimens and artifacts. And our mission has never been more relevant than right now where we're dealing with a biological phenomenon that has us all having the conversation we're about to have today involving a virus that jumped from another species to humans and it's had an overwhelming event effect on all of human culture and society. Uh, specifically for us, we've been closed since March 13th. That means no visitor or auxiliary revenues associated with visitors, no events. Uh, our only revenue really is philanthropy at the behest of our wonderful donors. We're projecting losses that reign cumulatively over this year and next between 80 and $120 million. That is not a small amount of money. Uh, and so it has led us to significant reductions in staff, which have been agonizingly painful. Uh, it has led us to delays in exhibitions, to um, suspension of public programs, of school group visits, and to shifts in hours and operations, all things you could all predict and probably <clears throat> are experiencing. Um, I would just add quickly at this moment that our response has been to double down on our mission, which is so germane to everything that's happening right now, and to do it in ways that are accessible to all, which is a driving feature of our institution in terms of inclusivity. That includes uh, uh, pushing out content digitally extensively, and we can talk more about that. So maybe that's a good place for me to stop and let others comment. And Michael, you can't stop any more than Ellen can, right? I mean, you, you have expenses, you have staff, you have art to maintain, uh, to conserve. Yeah, I mean, we're the largest art museum in the Western United States. And, and um, it is a, a role we play, not just in scale, but in presence for the community uh, in Los Angeles and beyond. And it's been, it is, as, <clears throat> as Ellen said, it's been really, painful to see the losses around us in terms of people. The art world travels. And so many people have gotten sick just because sickness and travel go together. And so we've, the entire art world has stopped and there's been a sadness to it. Obviously the financial struggles, um, the, uh, the loss of revenues, which have threatened our very livelihoods, not just us, but we feel this in camaraderie with all our, in, all our fellow institutions around us. I mean, we're closest to our Los Angeles institutions, but I'm on the phone internationally. We have Zoom calls around the world with institutions, all sharing a kind of suffering, but also um, trying to look forward. Uh, as Ellen said, almost all of us, we closed on March 11th. By March 14th, we had ripped up our homepage and we're offering all our, our digital assets um, and then started to produce new ones. You wow. know, there are 800,000 LAUSD school kids home and not necessarily wanting to do their homework. <laughs> so <laughs> we turned our entire education force. Luckily, we've, we've kind of held on and paid everyone uh, we've, we've been able to do that right now. It's not indefinite, obviously. We don't know when we're reopening, but we've kind of turned our entire teaching artist force that would otherwise be in the schools to make home videos on how to make art. <laughs> and the wonderful thing <laughs> about, this, about this, um, this venue here is that we get to have uh, the East Coast, the West Coast, and of course, the Midwest represented here and, and different museums, you overlap. You were talking about children in the LAUSD uh, system. 
And of course, Jeffrey's business is very much predicated Absolutely. on children of all ages. Jeff, how, how are you uh, encountering this in Indianapolis? Well, very similar to Ellen and, and, and Michael. We're small by comparison of, the, of, of those two museums, about 1.3 million visitors, $40 million budget, $300 million endowment, 400 staff and 1,000 volunteers. And fortunately, we've been able to hang on to all of our full and part-time and occasional staff because of our, our endowment. But we, like Ellen and Michael, are projecting significant earned revenue and con some contributed revenue losses this year that will impact our, per our, our performance in 2021 and 22 and, and, and 2023. So um, like both, both of those wonderful institutions, we've turned to a, mu we call it museum at home. So we're generating lots of, of, of video, some of it now, and we also have an outdoor space. And so we have, uh, sign up for your personal tra exercise trainer and our sports legends experience that you can do online, but it's not a substitute for being there in person. Um, and we're having to re-engineer and take this time to re-engineer our, our exhibits and imagine a children's museum and similar to American Museum of Natural History, lots of things to touch. And so we've got to, uh, and we are re-engineering to make it more, let's call it COVID resistant uh, for when we do, for when we do open. And art is also becoming very much an interactive space, right? I mean, if you look at the, the uh, great work in back of uh, you, Michael, it's really meant to be interacted with, right? So you yeah. have this whole issue of, of how do you create interactions when the interactions that we're accustomed to having are all physical? It's all in this same space where, whether we're in uh, New York in your museum, uh, Ellen, or, or in LA or in Indianapolis, we're, we're also interacting with each other, we're enjoying with each other. How do you create, and that's part of the challenge, how do you create this sense of community surrounding our transfer of knowledge, and particularly with the experts who you all employ, the curators and the, and the various people who each contribute their expertise, how do you create that in this kind of a space? Oh, I like Jeff's word very much of re-engineering. I think we're re-engineering both for on-site and online for what I would characterize as a reimagined world um, that will be changed in some ways forever. And I think that we've all used digital and we've all used our on-site home space capacity or home court advantage very effectively, but almost adjacently uh, when we're at our best, it's been more integrated, but largely adjacently. And I think now this is going to drive us to a true blended model, which will increase accessibility, empower us to create communities that are both online and on site in a more blended way, and that we'll get better and better at it. It's worth saying that you know a lot of people feared for colleges and universities, which is my former background in life, um, that the digital would take over uh, the on-site institution. And some people worried about that for museums too, way back when. I think we know now that we're social animals. We want that spiritual connection. We want to be together. And we're going to figure out how to take these two powerful ways of getting together, make them each work, and I want to say importantly, safely. We're going to take it in stages. We're going to do it slowly. We're going to learn but we're gonna make it work and we're gonna make them work together interactively and really have a holistic sense of what our audience is. We don't have all those answers, but we're gonna find them. And as a community, we're gonna find them to create yeah. a community. You're right, Ellen. And I think that that idea that we've also, I mean, you know, everybody's so busy in our physical space that this time we have now to focus on the digital space to create that balance, which will create reach. Um, <laughs> the digital background you can download. <laughs> in LA, we've been talking a lot about changing the language to and stop the use of social distancing, talk about physical distancing because we want social closeness anyway. We are all social animals. We Part of the reason we have these institutions is to bring people together around knowledge, experience, and each other. So we have to find ways to compensate um, and create that uh, social closeness in any case through knowledge is one way. We had a seminar, uh, the other day one of our curators developed and 
there's also a sadness in that is that um, a friend of mine said they never thought they would see the level of racism against Chinese Americans uh, as it is today. They thought never again would that happen. And one of our curators started a seminar, which was about racism as a public health crisis. We had 2,000 people sign up in, in 15 minutes for this seminar webinar, and it was uh, 1,600 people were there. And it was a really spirited conversation about how the art world cares so much about you know, we care about our localities, but also about this sense of everyone together globally and, and, and fairness and exchange. And I think that power of, of, of the fairness and exchange among everyone is coming through in this digital world, too. So it's a push and pull. We'll never replace the physical experience of taking your selfie at Urban Light or, or communing in, uh, I hope, in a spiritual way almost with an artwork. But um, I think the balance is good for us. I'm so reassured that both Ellen and, and Michael are talking are not talking about full investment into digital and online and all that, because we know that, again, we are social animals and being in this space to see the works of art, to see the objects, to interact with them in some way. Uh, for us, we're going to be, as I, we're re-engineering, thinking about using our costume-themed interpreters in new ways for touching with your, with your eyes and your mind, and, but being there to see the object see the work of art, we'll, you cannot replace that uh, on, online. We can augment. That, that, that is a such thing, a keen but. point. I mean, because for us with, with collections that really represent a, uh, a record of life on earth, what we know is the power of reality for all the power of the virtual, the power of the real object, a dinosaur bone. There really is nothing like it. And so right. we don't want to lose that. What we want to do is create ways to, as Michael said so eloquently, have people physically distanced to enjoy it on, on the one hand, but also find ways to extend and uh, extend that experience online before they visit, when they visit, after they mm -hmm. visit, and to create a seamless connection across all of those. You know, we got a question from Karen Wise, who used to work at the Natural History Museum um, of Los Angeles, and she, she um, was wondering um, how we are going to approach uh, young people in particular who don't necessarily have access to technology. You know, we have a lot of people in our public school systems who just don't have these, these facilities. Do you have any approaches that you've been discussing internally? We've been talking about well, there's a difference between home access, neighborhood access, and school access. And depending on the, the neighborhood and the school, it could be could be quite different. For the neighborhoods surrounding the school, the, the museum, we have a, a special relationship uh, anyway, and have been providing some laptops to youth who are engaged in our what we call our Mid North Promise program to provide to make sure that access is there. For schools, we're looking at a membership initiative that would include online uh, uh, creation, or I should say an online collection of, of videos that could be used with our staff or alone with units of study that teachers, teachers would use. So trying to meet schools where they will be versus the traditional field trips, which are important to both, uh, all three of our institutions, because we know there's a link between field trips and visits with mom and dad. Uh, post field trip. So becoming I, I more think also there are oriented. ways to meet people in their communities. I mean, I think again, it's this, uh, it, it, it's understanding how to do more than one thing at a time. Michael made the, the good point that, well, we're never going to stop focusing on these remarkable spaces that we have because they're so powerful. But that doesn't mean we can't be in the community as well with objects. Yeah with educators, et cetera. We're deeply working with the schools, always training teachers. We train between four and 5,000 science teachers a year. So, and we're doing it both online and on site. So the, those things won't stop. And reaching into the community, as well as bringing the community into us, I think is gonna be the way to go. Yeah, it, it, we, we all will be back in schools as soon as we can. That's the best distribution system. But also people have taken it upon themselves. There was a beautiful article about the porch concerts of one family in Pasadena yeah. that are just offering them on the street. So it's also people to people. Our institution's reach is limited in that way. And I think that, uh, you know, that there, there is inspiration in what people are doing for others in neighborhoods. Andrew Barnes also asked a very interesting question that, it, that, that goes to the heart of, of how do you, how do you, um, 
how do you make decisions as to what you keep and what you don't keep in terms of, uh, he asked about, uh, about the digital side, but it, it's also true in terms of uh, decision-making in terms of the competencies and the investments that you make. You're going to have to shift how you invest uh, scarce resources and how you measure impact and how you ma measure reach. Those conventional measures are all going to, to change and indeed all of our jobs become different. I'll, I'll just take a very, very simple example. You each have security in your buildings. Security has had a particular function for uh, art, for objects, for, for uh, young people running around a, a, a uh, place of creative uh, play and learning. Well, security now where we're going to be interacting digitally now has a, a, an additional meaning. Um, how, how are you thinking about, about the changes that you'll have to integrate into every single function uh, that you have? Michael, you mentioned traveling. Well, traveling is not going to be the way that people uh, connect and communicate and reach agreements. Um, how does that function? I guess in part this way, right? Yeah, no, I think that the question of travel is a big one because there have been movements, I think, in Europe, a lot of museums have been talking about not traveling just to stem climate change and to think about reducing carbon emissions, that there's a, there's this attention about travel. I think one of the possibilities of blending the digital and the real is once you know people to keep those relationships alive globally, to keep exchange global, but, but maybe less physical travel, maybe the audiences and our focus is is more local and and i think that's what we're trying to negotiate now because there just isn't going to be travel we're going to have to send artworks without couriers we're going to have to negotiate things over zoom calls but but that doesn't mean that that there isn't the real in the local and i actually for one am looking forward to that focus on locality so if i know tourism losing tourism is bad for the economy but there's a moment here where we can really speak about our audience being our local audience and that focus will also help us sharpen our points of view uh, in terms of our locality. We saw some of that with the recession, Adam, you may have as well. Uh, yes. We assumed that travel, because of all the economic challenges, that it would be a slow return to the museum and actually staycation took, do took over. And we were slammed and had a huge increase mm -hmm. in membership and a huge increase in, mm -hmm. in uh, a, a visitation because of the staycation, uh, staycation yeah. phenomena. And we and we had 9/11, so as well as the nice. recession. So we've seen it. This is this that. is the third go around. Um, I, I guess what I would say is we don't have all the answers, and what we're trying to do is take it in stages. Uh, we're an institution with roughly five million visitors, a big chunk of whom are international uh, and domestic all over the country. But right now, I do think we'll, one of the questions we keep asking ourselves is what does it mean to be open? Uh, and it's certainly, to Michael's point, is likely to be local. But local will be maybe very local in the first instance, then throughout five boroughs of Manhattan, New York State. And the tri-state region is very important to us, picking up uh, New Jersey and Connecticut, as well as other parts of New York State. So I think opening in stages with the maxim absolutely of safety first, both for staff and for visitors is going to be where we go. And we're going to learn as we go. And I, I think we're all capable of that. And we're also going to have to think about evolving our revenue models because our revenue models very often were about memberships that, that were associated with a certain frequency of visit and a certain density of visitors. Uh, there, it's also associated with a ticketing um, experience uh, in, in many cases. And those kinds of revenues are going to take a hit. They already have, and they will in the future. But we have to figure out a way if we're going to be uh, social animals and we're going to bring people together for experiences, we have to figure out a way without offending people to also ask for support so that we can continue to do this and also redirect that revenue into investments that make that experience better. Yeah, you know, it's, uh, I do remember, and Ellen, you were talking about 9-11, yes, I was running an institution in New York City in 9-11, and the one thing I remember about that, other than the tragedy and just total chaos and uncertainty so extremely, um, was how quickly uh, philanthropy rebounded, that, you know, our main revenue stream in the end is philanthropy, that it, we are institutions that others care for us so we can care for others. And 
Um, we've received some emergency grants unsolicited already from members our, of our community who care a lot about what we do. Um, of course, we've developed a revenue stream model just to keep doing more because that's our job. But if I do believe there's an understanding of the importance of all of our institutions as social hubs, as educational hubs, um, connections for people, and that I, I have this great faith that philanthropy will come back sooner than you think, because everybody says, oh, well, nobody, ha they're, they're all being hit, so they won't. But top on the list is to care for people generally. And we're all part of the, um, I would say, spiritual, e educational, as well as economic recovery. The jobs we create, uh, people we employ, uh, the, the mental health issues are, are, are so huge right now. So I think people realize that we are central to society, not peripheral. And philanthropy, hopefully, will, will keep us going. Yeah, I, I think that's a, a vital point, because we certainly are want to be part of the New York recovery. And we think that we, I mean, New York's been so hard hit by all of this, of course, so is California. But we, we really see ourselves as participating in New York City's recovery. And that recovery itself, which will pick up all of the cultural sector, all of the hospitality sector, the life of a city that we're all in, we're all involved in cities, and that too will lift all the boats. And so I, I think our, our shared role and the, and the public's understanding and yearning really, the comment that you made, Michael, about talking to people all over the world, we're doing the same. And in many of the international cities, the, the public has actually come to the institutions and said, please reopen. We need you. And so I, I think that this, this notion of recovery and all together is also going to be part of it. What I find to be so interesting is this, is this combination of local, right? This, this sort of um, focusing on local because uh, travel is so difficult, but also the opportunity to go international, the discussions that are happening right now and the inflection to sharing uh, more and more digitally now provides real opportunities to take this model. And let's face it, the museum model has been around for a long time and it hasn't really changed that much, but now it must change, doesn't it? I mean, we are kind of forced to reinvent. Um, and, and while we've had the luxury of slow walking that reinvention, now we don't have that luxury anymore, do we? I don't think so. I, I, I agree with you. And I, again, I'm so reassured by Michael and, and Ellen in thinking about it's, it's safety, it's slow, it's careful, but it's also about the high quality experience. It's integrating virtual with, with tactile and, and, and all of that and local with, you know, thinking local, but also thinking global at the same time and what the technologies can, can do to really improve the entire condition of the, of the museum, of the museum community. What's also wonderful, and I want to thank you all. We're going to end on a, on a note. We're going to go through, go around the table and talk a little bit about how your staffs are dealing with this and, and uh, talk about the, the optimist, uh, optimism and empowerment that, that you all represent. But I want to thank you for coming together. We have here a very unusual gathering. Um, very often we stay within our respective worlds. But since we're all encountering similar problems in, similar ge in different geographies, in completely different but related institutions, it's wonderful to be able to share knowledge like this. And, and we're going to keep the dialogue going. I know each of you are. But thank you so much for, for all uh, attending. Let's, let's go through. Uh, Ellen, let's start with you. And then we'll go to uh, Michael and then Jeff. Uh, could you talk a little bit about how your people are driving the change in your institution? Well, I, I don't think there's any way to characterize it other than it's been very, very challenging and uh, some levels of anguish depending upon personal circumstances and familial circumstances and those things just are, are paramount. Um, I think if I had to, and also sadness that we've had to do reductions I and mean, sadness throughout the institution, uh, at the same time, I've been so moved by the reactions, notwithstanding all of that, of, and the statements that people have made about their, how strongly and passionately they feel about what the museum does, about the institution itself, our mission, their colleagues. Uh, it's been profoundly moving and gratifying. And I think in a funny way, because we're a science institution, it's about evolution. 
everybody understands that this is survival on the one hand and evolution and moving through something on the other. Uh, and there's another concept, evolution can be very slow on the one hand, but there are these moments of what is called punctuated equilibrium when there's a burst of activity. And so we are moving through the slow parts and looking forward to the punctuated equilibrium. Well said, I Ellen. I, I love <laughs> <Yes>. it, I love it. Yeah, you know, listen, crises bring out the strengths and the weaknesses of any organization. And I, I can say for myself that it's been uh, a joy to see the strengths of people coming together. Like, I've never seen so many thank you notes among staff to each other talking about them supporting each other. So that in itself, that expression. And then in this question of locality and global and digital and real, I mean, times like this do heighten awareness so that we will focus on things that are really important in person and immersive and powerful in our physical locations and know that we have to reach out more broadly through these other digital means. And there is a re uh, reflection that's part of this. And that thinking that I think, Ellen, will help us uh, advance and evolve as institutions because anytime you reflect and stop for a moment, it allows you to take stop, stock and, and rethink. So that, that is a benefit. Jeff? Uh, yes, I, I agree with both Ellen and, and, and Michael. I, one of the things that is clear at the Children's Museum is there are staff who, uh, many of whom have young children and the young, young children are home and some are like, please let me go to work. <laughs> please let me go to work. And, uh, you know, so there are many that can't wait to get back and others that, and we've done two, we'll, we've done one survey about ready to do another one uh, shortly and that are, are very nervous about, about coming back and knowing that there is this spectrum on, uh, of public behavior that is, uh, on the one hand, very careful, wanting to make sure social physical distancing is in place, and the other end, uh, which is um, people that are ignored, I don't mean staff, I'm talking about the public, that w could, ign could ignore it. And, I, and it, it, is, it is scary. Um, but I think lots of thank you notes uh, among staff to each other has been wonderful, wonderful to see and gratifying to see, as well as thank yous to our board of trustees for supporting the entire staff during this period uh, thus far, and that's been heartening as well. Well, it, it is heartening. It's, it's the human effort, it's the human creativity, it's the human uh, resilience that we are depending on and that will see us through this. Thank you all for, uh, for being part of this uh, short discussion and, um, and, and thank you so much. Thank you all for attending.